have today. It's a full day. Hopefully the rain will subside as, uh, as we progress into the day. But uh, there are a great deal of um, uh, presentations and lab visits and demos uh, sort of being arranged to, for you as we speak. Marcus Greiner, who will present at 9.30, is setting up his, uh, his uh, superconducting experiment. And there will be, in fact, uh, very soon liquid nitrogen brought up for uh, really, if you've ever used liquid nitrogen, you know how, how wonderful it is. Um, so let me give you, uh, I, I will have a couple of questions from, from especially the kids. But let me uh, introduce myself. My name is Hossein Sadikpour. I'm the director of the, the institute, which is hosting this, this program today. But of course, there is a great deal, which also you won't, you're going to see in the physics department and also in the, in, in, in the applied sciences. Yeah. And then uh, you'll go over uh, around four, roughly around 4 o'clock at the end to the to the, to the science center, which is fairly close to the physics department, and if it doesn't rain, it's a nice walk, um, where uh, there will be a dem demo of the, of the hologram. Okay. But now let me ask the question from the kids, I sort of get a sense of the grade level. Um, in, uh, from, from, let's say if you're a junior high, raise your hand, and then, okay, uh, what we call middle school here. And if you're high school, raise your hand. OK. OK. Um, so let me, because uh, what I was going to sort of consider my job today, I think what I'm going to do is also bring the, the light down to be at the level of a video presentation was to sort of tie some aspects of the presentations and, uh, OK, some reason. It's not helping out. Okay, some uh, aspects of the demonstrations which you're going to see today, presentations and, and demonstrations and, 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 and lab visits. Okay, so I'm sure everybody has heard what an atom is, right? Hmm? It's a proton, it's a nucleus, and an electron, right? It sort of visits around, if you think of it like a, you know, Earth going around the sun, right? But that picture, is, of course, is not complete. But this is not new. We've known this for now almost 100 years. So you're going to see some effects of the fact that an electron is not an Earth and a proton is not the sun in action today. Okay? So at ITAM, just to give you an idea, we do theory uh, for, for interactions between atoms and molecules. How do they absorb light? How do they interact with each other? What happens uh, when you uh, change their properties, you know, their temperatures, their densities, their, and, uh, and their conditions? When you change atoms and molecules, what happens to those things? So there are people here, faculty, students, postdocs, who do these sort of research, collaborate with each other, mentor other students. Okay? You're going to see some of the students and postdocs today, in fact. Okay? And you will get to sit down with them and ask questions, any, more or less any questions you have. Well, OK, so some questions you have. OK. While we do theory at ITAMP, of course, theory, OK, there are two ways you can do science, more or less. One is to go and get your hands dirty, as Marcus will soon demonstrate, and do an experiment, or sit behind a computer 
or in your uh, office, of course not alone necessarily, but work with a pencil and paper or write on a computer, right? But neither of them can, can live without each other. They have to come together in order to make science. Why is that? Because I can make any theory of the world. You can do it too, in fact. There's nothing that inhibits you. This is a free country. But that theory, if it doesn't meet the experiment, so if Mark, Marcus goes in the lab and does an experiment and does not see what you have predicted, or others do not see what you have predicted, then your theory is problem, has a problem, right? So you have to go and re refine it. So they have to work together. And this is what you're going to see also today. Okay. Now, this is also the Center for Astrophysics. And everything we, we see, which comes to us from up there, from the universe, has to come from some atoms and some molecules interacting and doing something, right? Otherwise, where does light come from? It has to come from an atom or a molecule, right? Otherwise, we won't be able to see light. This light is exactly that. It's this, some fluorescence of a, of a gas. Or maybe it's an LED. I don't know which it is now <laughs> these days. OK? So you're going to see some of those things, again, involving atoms and molecules in action. So again, as I said, this is the Center for Astrophysics. So let me show you this. Does anybody know? I've already written it down. But does anybody know what this picture is? It's a very famous picture. Yeah. It's the beginning picture of the Big Bang. Exactly. <clears throat> I should have a pointer. Yes, exactly. It's called, it's called the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, okay? the CMB. Okay? It's when the universe was about 400,000 years old. And in fact, it's the oldest light in the, in the universe. Right? So you're looking, at, by looking at this map, it's the map of a universe, this is the oldest light, the first light that actually became visible to the universe. We weren't around then, right? This is 400,000 after the Big Bang. Does anybody know how old the universe is? 13.7 billion years. Billion years, yes, that's right, that's right. So it was a very long time ago, but this is the oldest light. Now, when this, this was discovered in, 19, in, in 1974, I think, or is it 64, I forget now, by Wilson and Penzias. Wilson, actually, he's here, not, not in this room, but in, in, in this building, has an office. And they won the Nobel Prize for this. Okay? So everywhere you look in the universe, you, if you have an antenna, a radio antenna, you can detect this. You can go home and build an antenna, like a horn antenna, and, and point it. You have to go somewhere where there's not enough, there's a lot of radio you know, interference, and you will see this. You will hear it. Is temperature, because in, in physics, a lot of the things that we sort of define is in terms of, has to have some properties, like temperature, like density. Okay? In this case, temperature gives sort of a sense of what what, um, what its energy is. It's about 3 Kelvin. Now, 3 Kelvin, for those of you who may not know, know, know the scale of Kelvin, is minus 270 degrees Celsius. In Fahrenheit, it would be, what, uh, minus 457, I think? 460 is the absolute zero. So it's about more, minus 457 degrees Fahrenheit. It's very cold. But, you're here, and you're lucky enough to actually see an example where there is even something colder than this. Okay. But when it was emitted about 400,000 years ago, its temperature was about 3,000 degrees. Does anybody know what happened? It went from 3,000 to 3, 3 degrees. Any students? Parents don't have to raise their hands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is yeah, light diffusion there that exists, yes. But have you heard of redshifting? All right. If something is very far, as it comes toward us, its frequency decreases slowly. Of course, there is a certain mathematical relations to describe it, but it keeps coming to us 
and it gets the frequency becomes less, its temperature becomes less, 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 until we see it today at 3 Kelvin. Okay. But all of this, at one point, when it came, must have come from a transition in atomic hydrogen, mainly. There are some other residual things, like helium, but absolutely nothing else. Everything is there, must have come from a transition in atomic hydrogen. Okay? You don't have to know these things, but just that an atom has a states, it transitions. And all of this light, it's the, it's the oldest light, came from one atom, hydrogen atom. Now, if you look at the sun from very far, it looks like this, right? This, in fact, is a... Right? This is how, when you're growing up, that's how the sun looks like. In fact, it's more or less not, not terribly out of, uh, out of realm of reality. Okay? But where does this color come from? Any takers? It has to, right? Yeah, I've... I've uh, well, the light from this sun, sun is, the light uh, that, 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 that comes from the sun takes about 8.3 8 minutes to get to here. So its redshift is very tiny. There is a redshift, but very tiny. But I think I've given you the answer to all of the questions I'm going to ask, is that there must be an atomic system going on. What happens is this was actually discovered in the 1940 by Chandra Sekhar. Um, <clears throat> who, who theorized okay, that the hydrogen atoms can attract an electron. So an electron comes and attaches to a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom is made of an electron and a proton, and another electron comes and gets stuck. Okay? When it gets stuck, it makes an ion, right? Ion is, can be either positively charged or negatively charged. In other words, it can lose an electron or gain an electron. In this case, it gained an electron became H minus. It has only one bound state. You know, remember this uh, picture I showed you? There are states. So this H minus has only one. But that's trivial matter here. But then when it loses the electron, it loses it at about at, at 6,000 degrees Kelvin. That's precisely the surface temperature of the sun. So this is what you see. You see a transition in negative I. It's called the solar opacity. It comes from H minus. And that's what gives this the color. Today, you're going to see <clears throat> images and videos of much higher definition, of course, of this sun. You're going to see something like this. Okay. Now, of course, the sun, does anybody know what these things are? Solar flares. Solar flares, and they go into a, the whole atmosphere, which is around the sun, and extends <clears throat> millions of miles into space, or millions of kilometers, if you're in a metric system. <laughs> They're all very large. It's called corona, the solar corona. Okay? That's where the flares are. You're going to see those today. <clears throat> you're going to see loops and all of these things. Again, all of those things, everything which is in the corona is charged particles, charged atoms. Mostly positive ions. Okay. We have a name for it. We call it plasma. Okay. So that's what you will see today. Okay. The corona is made of, that's what gives rise to the solar winds, which is, gets caught in the Earth's uh, magnetosphere. And we call that, does anybody know what we call it? Northern, Northern Light. But of course, the universe is much more complicated, as life is much more complicated. It should be. Right? You're growing up. Okay? Things look complicated. But trust me, it will get even more complicated, but actually more enjoyable too, if you know how to manage it. There are more than atoms. There are molecules. And what are those mo molecules? Molecules is when you take an atom, if it wants to, stick another atom nearby and sort of bind together. Bring another one. 
bring another one. You make another. So you can make all kinds of molecules. Here's one. Pittert butyl toluene. I have no idea what it is. It's, <laughs> this is his formula. It's made of carbon, hydrogen, carbon, and you know, number of carbon atoms and number of hydrogen atoms. It's actually used in fragrance manufacturing. So maybe if you put the, you know, the cologne on, it, this could be in there. But it's a very complicated, I mean, in fact, they're much more complicated, right? Biological molecules, the stuff that we're made of, is much more complicated. But how do we make uh, sense of it? Right? A method, which you will hear about today, is called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. It allows you to sort of identify lines, atomic, you know, the uh, transition line, in, 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 in this molecule. This is this molecule. And, and, and understand how it forms, what it does, how you can use it in, in uh, real life situations. It's called an NMR. Okay. How many of you have had MRI? You have had MRI? Yeah. My goodness. <laughs> okay, that's this. Okay. It used to be called NMR, but nuclear magnetic resonance really threat, you know, really scared people. <laughs> so I made it MRI. Now, but this is Earth. The space also has lots of molecules. In fact, molecular clouds. Okay, this is one. I think it's the horse, uh, horse, horse head uh, uh, nebula. Now, to give you an idea of the extent of these clouds, which have lots of molecules in them, all kinds of molecules. This is about roughly 300 uh, light years. Okay? It takes 300 years for the light to travel from one side to the other. Very large. So when you hear that the space is empty, of course it is, but it's also very large. There's more, there are more molecules in space than, of course, there are on, the, on Earth. We know that, right? Did we? Okay. So. But in order to understand these, we have to understand how they, these complex molecules actually form in the conditions of outer space. You know, it can be cold, it can be very dilute, okay? it can be very inhospitable, but we have to do it on Earth. So you'll see a presentation to that effect today. Now, here's one which I, I myself like. Okay? HDO. You know what, how many people know what the D is? It's like H2O. We know what H2O is, right? That's water. Same water we drink. It's, uh, exactly. It's deuterium. It's, it's when you take hydrogen atom and you stick in a, a, a neutron inside. Inside the nucleus, that is. Of course, not by hand, but okay. uh, it, it takes a nuclear reaction to do it which you can do a lot in stars. So <clears throat> you make HDO and you, make, you have H2O. Now, if you can do a spectroscopy, the details should not matter here. So you will see differences between this guy and this guy. It's a very sensitive probe of where things have come from because we know that most of the deuterium, right, were made in the early universe. We haven't made a whole lot. We, we still make them. Even a nuclear reactor can make them. But we don't make a whole lot of them. Most of it was made back during the Big Bang time. So if you can, if you can do these sort of changes, you get an idea where actually water came from on Earth. So here's an example. If you go to the oceans of the Earth, and look at the D over H, deuterium over hydrogen ratio. How many deuterium atoms are there compared to how many hydrogen atoms are there in a, in a water, in our oceans, right? You get this line, okay? It's called the uh, Vienna mean water uh, uh, ratio, D over H ratio. It's just a name, okay? Now, if you look at the same ratio in Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune is all over here, much less. Now, if you go to some of the comets, they fall here. Some of you may have heard of Halley's Comet, 
right? It comes to Earth, I don't know how many times in a century. Okay, good. <laughs> it sits here, right? It's D over H ratio is here. As I said, this is very sensitive. So this is difference can tell us a whole lot, and it does. This guy, 67P. Does anybody know what this guy is? It's a comet. It's a very famous comet, actually. It's been in the news, in fact, yesterday. No? Rosetta. That landed on, on this comet. Yes. Okay. The probe which landed two years ago, and yesterday the actual uh, satellite was crashed into it simply because it, ran, it just had ran out of fuel and they, they, didn't, they, didn't, they, they, wouldn't be, they didn't want to have it a space junk some four, 500 million kilometers in space. Okay. So they, they, yesterday they crashed it into the comet, into this comet. Okay. They, they took a lot of data, in fact. And this is one of them, one of the bigger ones. So they found that this comet had D over rate ratio, which was not like that of the Earth. But then, they, when they look at all kinds of meteorite fragments which come to Earth, asteroid fragments, they all bunch up over here, right about where the Earth is. Right? And what this does gives a fairly strong indication that the water on Earth actually may have come from asteroids. In fact, there is a very strong indication that it did come from asteroids and meteorites. Okay. It, there's a physical explanation for it. But have they found any on Mars? Any, well, I mean, there's some uh, indications. Oh, that I don't know. That I don't know. It's not here, although this is the latest one, so that I don't know. Even if it were, I would imagine it would, it would pile up over here. It's part of, part of the planetary system. So. so by just doing atomic physics, right? This is water. You know, you, I have it here. And, and HDO is not that difficult to, to find. By the way, what is D2O? That's a famous name. Some of you may know. Take heavy water. OK, now I want to bring you to this cosmic microwave background. We said this temperature is 3 Kelvin, OK? Minus 270 degrees Celsius, excuse me. Is this the coldest temperature in the universe? Right? It obviously, if it were, my presentation more or less would end here. <laughs> and Marcus would not have to give his demonstration. It is not. Everything else that is done to make it colder must have been done by man mm -hmm. in the lab. Okay. So you will see liquid nitrogen in a few minutes. Liquid nitrogen is at 77 degrees Kelvin. That's minus 196 degrees Celsius. Okay. Not quite as cold as this guy. It's minus 321 degrees um, Fahrenheit. It's when air freezes. In fact, you'll see when the stuff condenses up, you know, as vapor, that's what it is today. Okay. But you can actually now do experiments, very precise experiments, so you get to near absolute zero. You put atoms or molecules into a, into a lab, into a trap, I'll give you some very brief hints because you'll see presentations to those effects, and you get to absolute zero. So here's one presentation you'll see about laser cooling. In this case, laser cooling of a molecule. So suppose you have an atom. It's sitting there, not moving. Okay? You hit it from the left and the right with a, with a, with a laser, with this laser, or, or <laughs> not this quite this laser, but let's say laser. Right? It's not moving. What would it do? If the laser is red, means that it's not on, 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 on transition with, this, with the atom. It won't do anything, right? It would just sit there, it gets trapped. The moment it wants to move, okay, the moment, let's say, it moves to the right in this, in this picture, it's going to see a red laser facing it. This one is a green laser. Red meaning red as in Doppler red, right? 
if I'm standing here and you shout at me, okay, but then turn around and again shout, but shout now walking away from me, I will hear two different pitches, right? It's, it's a Doppler. It's the same thing as standing in a, in, in, on, on a by, by side of the road and hear a car coming or hear a car going away, the same go, car going away. You hear two different pitches. It's called the Doppler effect. Okay? So this now will kick it in the opposite direction, this other laser. So the, photo, the atom is coming this way. It will get kicked this way. And then it would, this guy would have a Doppler effect and then would kick it this way. And back and forth, back and forth, back and forth many times until the atom comes to the rest. You get this. So now... It's not done only with atoms. We're beginning to do with molecules, which are much more, much more difficult to do. Okay. The last concept I'm going to describe is an optical lattice. What's an optical lattice? You get two lasers and you counter-propagate them in this way. Have you heard of a standing wave? Have you set up a standing waves in water? Right? You drop a pebble into the water and you see waves go out for a while. Right? But it's a stationary. It's like a standing wave. So it forms waves like this. And now you can put atoms inside these. Once they get inside, they're trapped. And there's a lot more physics involved, but for the, for, for the purpose of today, they're trapped. They're sitting there. And you can now do all kinds of things with them. Okay? So this is what is known as the egg carton picture of an optical lattice. Right? These wiggles is light wiggling two lasers coming like this, setting up these standing waves. And these are atoms, which sit there okay, most of the time happily, so you can, you can check them. You can do things with them. One of the things which Marcus may describe today, but is done in his lab, is the so-called quantum gas microscope. So what you're looking at is atoms sitting in, a, in an optical lattice like this, right? An optical lattice like an egg, uh, you know, uh, a carton, you can put atoms inside, many of them, and here's a picture. You can actually see individual atom. Right? That's why it's called a microscope. It's quantum because atoms here are really quantum systems. And here's one atom, here's another atom sitting next to it. You can see patterns, right? Because it's an optical lattice, it's like this, it's periodic. Now, these guys now are sitting there near absolute zero. Near absolute zero, but close. Okay? So, with this, I think I'm going to end and hand over to Marcus. You're going to. Yeah. Okay.